Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E and J Gallo Winery. Agriculture, it's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we're gonna spin you through the mini cycles of cotton. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we take you on another ag venture. Today we're talking cotton, but the most important aspect to start on any operation is safety. I'm near Five Points today at a cotton harvest safety training, and I'm joined by Paul Williams, Senior Loss Control Consultant with the State Compensation Insurance Fund. Paul, thanks for having me out this morning. Thanks for coming. Well, Paul, let's begin with what exactly is State Compensation Insurance Fund? We are a workers' compensation insurance company. Well, and exactly what does that mean, and why are you at today's training? Our company insures the farmers and ranchers and their employees for uh, workplace injuries. Okay, and today's safety training is obviously to make sure these individuals have a very safe harvest season. Exactly. At the end of the day, we want each employee to go home safely to their family. Well, let's talk about the components that you have as part of the safety training. Today we have four sessions. We have one session on road safety. We have another session on heat illness. The main emphasis is on equipment safety, and we cover chemical safety. Approximately how many attendees do you have here today? Today we have about 175 people in attendance. And I think it's important to talk about this is not necessarily a short training. This is uh, almost three to four hours worth that these individuals are here to be a part of this. Right. These growers have invested about a half day of their employees' time to come out and get training. And our hope is to prevent workplace injuries on the farm. Good. And cotton harvest safety training is not the only training that State Fund does. No. We participate with a lot of our partners on various topics such as raisin and grape industry, and other crops as well. Well, good. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining me, and we're going to go check out the classes. Okay, thanks a lot. Para los que sean supervisores o sean empleadores, ustedes, supervisores, empleadores, son responsables por la seguridad y salud de los trabajadores que están administrando. Safety takes the investment of everybody on the farm. With me from VF Farms in Kerman, I have three of today's attendees, Ruben Alenez, Paul Betancourt, and Indy. Thanks for joining me, guys. Well, Paul, let's start with you. This is first off, it's about a half a day that you're not able to go out in the field and you're actually attending today's events. Mm -hmm. Why do you take this time to do this? Well, first it's the law. Uh, <laughs> second is a whole crop isn't worth one guy losing a finger. And third is these guys have worked for us for years and uh, we have a long-standing relationship. We care about them and we want to bring in the crop in a safe manner. Good, good. Well, Ruben, what, what have you learned today? Why is this training so important and what information are you able to take back to the farm? Okay, aprendiste hoy por qué es tan importante eso y qué tal la información puedes llevar de aquí al rancho. La información buena es de que cada año venimos a como bien un entrenamiento, un recordatorio de lo que estamos haciendo, seguridad para mí mismo, para mis compañeros y tener cuidado con los equipos. And we come here every year and it's a good reminder uh, to be careful uh, when we're working together around the equipment. Well, good. Well, I thank you guys so much for first off attending today's safety training and most importantly sharing some time with me. You bet. Thank you. California remains at the forefront of worldwide production because of the research and technology we have available here. It's because of people like Dr. Jeff Mitchell with the University of California Cooperative Extension. Jeff, thanks for having me out this morning. Thank you very much, Ryan. Well, Jeff, let's first start off with what exactly is the University of California Cooperative Extension? University of California Cooperative Extension is part of the land-grant university system throughout the United States. And what each state has a land-grant university, and what we are charged with doing is developing information in concert with farmers to help them become efficient, more efficient, and be able to provide sustainable production systems for the nation. And you're a cropping systems specialist. You're actually, a, a, by definition, a professor 
in this particular field, correct? Exactly right. So what we're trying to do is integrate all the components of different cropping systems, including the, 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 the soil management, the crop establishment, the crop growth and development, the fertilizer inputs, all dimensions, pest management, so it all comes together into systems. And what we're specifically working on is with farmers is trying to develop a systems that are more efficient, that are lower cost, and then also this sustain the resource base that farming is, is, is based on. Well, we're out here today near Five Points at the West Side Field Station, and you have an absolutely amazing display of some of the crops and types of uh, activities we see here on the West Side. Let's talk about this research facility first. Well, thank you very much. What, what we're doing here, this, this particular field is one of the about 50 different projects that the university <laughs> conducts every year here at this research and extension center in Five Points. And what we have done since 1999 in this very field is evaluate four different cropping systems. And the goal here is to try to find out if there are alternative production practices that can lead to the systems that will be cheaper, more efficient, and that also conserve the resource base. And by that we mean, can we cut costs, first of all, by reducing passes and tractor implement passes across the field? Can we become more efficient by uh, providing very precise, uniform amounts of water, for instance? And can we do our tillage operations in very, in very precise ways? And also, can we sustain the resource base by doing things like reducing the emissions of dust to the air? Also reducing uh, losses through, the, through the, the soil profile here. And another thing we're trying to do here is to store more carbon, atmospheric carbon, in plant material and also in residues that eventually improve soil quality. So we're trying to, trying to optimize the whole system in order that farmers can produce crops more cheaply and more efficiently. Well, what you were explaining to me is actually we're standing on top of last year's tomatoes crop, I believe. Exactly right. This, this cotton we're standing in right here, this has, there has been no tillage in this field since last, uh, since, well, for a long, many, <laughs> many years, actually. All right, and that means that after the tomatoes that were here last year were harvested, there, there was zero tillage, we no-till planted the cotton, and you can see we've got a fairly decent crop of cotton here. And after about three or four years of initial learning and, and learning curve negotiations that we had to address there, we're now able to successfully uh, produce cotton with, with these kinds of tillage practices. So it's been a big benefit. There are other benefits that we've seen in these kind of systems. I mentioned the, the ability to reduce dust emissions. Uh, up into the air. That's something that we've uh, documented and seen seeing reductions in about 60 to 80 percent reduction in, in particular matter emissions. We've also increased the amount of carbon that's in the soil, all right? Take an atmospheric carbon, CO2, into the soil and we've increased that about 25 percent there. The last thing we've been able to do is take advantage of the residues that are normally going to, naturally going to occur and accumulate in these systems on the soil surface and document how that they can actually reduce the amount of water that's lost oh. from the soil by evaporation. So it's that bundling or that packaging of systems benefits that we're trying to evaluate the performance of and share that information with farmers here locally in the San Joaquin Valley. Well, great. And let's finish off with what exactly, what type of cotton is this? And is there any other specific project that's going on here? Yeah, what, what we're looking at, this is a Pima cotton crop right here. And we rotate this every year with uh, uh, a processing tomato variety. Okay. So it is a common rotation for this particular region of the valley there. That, that uh, you know, when we started the project back in 1999, was these were common dominant crops here and they still are to, to a large extent here. Other things we're doing here in this particular study is uh, combining the practices with very efficient drip irrigation. In other fields we have at the field station we are exploring the potential of using uh, overhead mechanized center pivot irrigation as a way of also uh, being able to pursue these kinds of reduced tillage cropping systems. So, so it's putting a lot of the technologies, the ecology of the systems together and trying to come up with uh, efficient, cost effective and resource conserving uh, production alternatives. Well, this has been fantastic, Dr. Mitchell. I appreciate it so much. I thank you for bringing me out in the field. And Thanks. most importantly, we're actually headed off to see the history of some of this West Side. Thanks, Ryan.
Cotton has a rich history in the San Joaquin Valley. With me, I have Elizabeth Lavelle, who's going to share some of that. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Ryan, this is one of those crops that's really fun to share because we have a lot of great pictures taken by Pop Lavelle over the last century. But really, before Pop's time, we have on record that James Kincaid, near the Kings River, planted the first 100 acres of cotton about 1867. Wow. But it really was hard to get to market. They didn't have a nice infrastructure for it, so the cost became prohibitive, and it kind of went off for a while. But the boom in cotton really came in the early 20th century when a market glut developed in some of your crops, raisins and grapes. <laughs> because there were just too many and growers weren't getting the price that they wanted, which you know is a problem that you still have today. Yes, it is. Planters turned their attention to diversification and one of the crops they focused on was cotton. And you'll find this really interesting, I think. Some 30,000 acres were planted to cotton in the Central Valley. Is that a lot? That was a lot back then, considering it was all harvested by hand. That's right, and we're going to take a look at that in a moment. Experimentation in Fresno County began the process of developing a better strain of cotton, and in 1917 at UC Kearney Ranch, a professor stated that he thought cotton was going to become a major crop in our area. So I love this set of pictures. There are two of them. In 1918, you're actually looking at the very first bale of cotton ever weighed in Fresno County and it was grown by A.J. Malsbury and F.F. F. Bias. They love to put their names like that. They had 30 acres west of Fresno County, and you can see they're actually weighing this bale. Now, this is pre-compression, so this was really uncompressed big bales of cotton. And then even better, here is, this is actually, we know her name, Miss Dora. She is sitting atop the first bale of cotton. So what do you think they would have used that photo for? You know, I assume it was for a marketing purpose. Exactly <laughs> right. So early in 1918, they were trying to market cotton and, and everything about that. And Miss Dora was the lady of the land. She was picked to do that. So not long after that, here in 1919, we're seeing here at the Kearney Park. It was Kearney Ranch yeah. at that time. This is a very early uh, type of implement that they were used. This was plowing and har harrowing under the cotton plants at Kearney. So I'm assuming this is after harvest. Yeah. They probably were taking the plants and putting them back into the ground. Is that what it looks like That's to you? That's what it looks like there. And you can see it's actually the, the stalks behind there don't look a whole lot different than what we've seen today. No, they don't. And I don't think that they had as much fun harvesting them as what we're going to see later while they harvest the <laughs> plants here. But we went from that. And then by 1943, the International Harvest Company had manufactured the first successful mounted cotton picker. It was called Old Red. It is. <laughs> and it began being used in Fresno County right then in 1943. In 1970, Producers Cotton Oil Company actually restored and donated this first mechanical cotton picker in the whole U.S. to the Smithsonian, and you can actually go there and see that now. It's, and, this yeah. is definitely considered one of the biggest te technological advances that we had in the San Joaquin Valley. It was, at the time. and it imp impacted cotton harvest around the world because nothing had, had been used that way. But before all that, this picture will remind you of something that you've probably seen from your family the old white bags. And so many times when I've shown this photo, people say, I remember being a child and being in the field with my grandparents and they pulled me along on the end of this white bag and they would go out there and they would fill the bags by hand. And then in order to get paid, they would take them out and they would weigh them right here in the field. Something very different than today. It is very different today, and you just consider how much labor it took just to pick an acre of cotton. That's one of the reasons why, until some of this mechanical harvesting and, and such came along, it didn't grow forward too fast. No. And then we have some pictures that are really fun. <laughs> I love these because we're going later to see how the cotton is in the gin. Well, this is how it was in the old days, and you can see right here, this couldn't have been a lot of fun. Everything was free form. There were no compartments. You walked in there and you were actually living in this huge fun. It looked like fun. If you were a kid, maybe you thought that was fun. But I don't think these guys had a great time. It looks just like the Sierra Nevada when it snows. It does look like <laughs> snow. So I love being able to share some of these photos with you because it really is one of those times where we're seeing how things have changed. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing these amazing photos. I can't wait to learn more in future episodes. We have a lot more to come. Thanks so much. We're at Terra Nova Ranch just outside Hamlin. With me, I have General Manager Don Cameron. Don, thanks for joining me. Brian, pleasure to have you out. Well, Don, I want to start out with you're a first generation farmer. That's true. Uh, I got into farming about 30 years ago. I had no experience, uh, no family history, but uh, something I always wanted to do, and I was fortunate to get a start. I've uh, been here ever since. 
We're talking cotton today, but you guys are diversified growers. Talk about a few of the other products that you guys grow. Uh, we grow a lot of uh, wine grapes, canning tomatoes, dehydrator onions, carrots, a real uh, wide assortment. We also have about 10% of the ranch in uh, organic production where we grow uh, lettuce seed, uh, bell peppers, uh, a lot of different crops here. Now when we talk San Joaquin Valley and California cotton, there's two main types. Can you describe the differences of those? Yeah, we have uh, a Kala cotton, which has been grown since the early 1900s here in California, and then Pima cotton, which came in around 1990. Uh, currently, Pima cotton makes up about two-thirds of the cotton grown in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, it's really been the leader. It's known throughout the world. Uh, the mills and the buyers just love it because of the high quality. Well, Don, let's talk what it takes to grow this crop we see here behind us. When exactly is the seed planted, and from there, what's the process to grow this crop? Well, Ryan, we begin planting the seed in early April. We have to wait for the soil temperatures to reach the 58 degree level. We plant the seed, and then we proceed to grow the cotton throughout the summer until probably about late August, when we essentially turn the water off and allow the cotton to start drying down. Now, when you say cut the water off, one thing that I did notice out here is you have buried irrigation tape. Talk about right. that. We have buried drip tape throughout uh, all of our cotton fields and the majority of the other crops we grow here. To us, water is extremely precious and we want to uh, use every drop efficiently. And one thing I hear from other farmers, Don, is the consistency that the drip irrigation tape provides for the fields. Right, uh, Ryan, drip, drip irrigation allows us to have uniform fields. We're able to regulate the amount of water daily. We apply water every day, small amounts, so that we give the plant just what it needs uh, the crop is uniform throughout the whole field. The quality is actually better too. So it's a real win for us here. And now we're in the middle of harvest. What does it take to get these plants ready for that harvest season? Well, as I said, we, we turn the water off in late August, early September. That starts the process of drying the plant down. We put products on during early October that desiccate the leaves, allowing the, the, the leaves to dry up. We can't have green leaves when we, when we pick the cotton because it'll stain the, uh, the fiber, causing a green color, which our, our buyer definitely doesn't want. Our buyers expect high quality, beautiful cotton when they open it at the mill. Well, Don, when you talk higher quality, there's nothing much higher quality than the stuff we have behind us. It's absolutely gorgeous. You can see how shiny white and just perfect that this is gonna make a great, great product. What does it take to harvest this from the plant? Well, we have our, our cotton picker that uh, goes through the field, it actually wraps the fibers around spindles, little fingers, and then it moves it toward the back of the machine where it's uh, unwound and blown into the, uh, the picker basket. From there, it, uh, the picker, when the basket's full of cotton, will go to the module builder, dump it into the module builder, and then we'll put several basketfuls before we're finished. Uh, the module builder compacts the cotton and uh, allows it to be trucked to the cotton gin for, uh, for gin. And when we talk about the cotton gin, we know it's going to be processed there. We're actually headed off to see a gin after this visit. But where does this specific cotton from your fields end up? Well, this is a very special cotton. It's even a higher quality than the traditional Pima that's grown here in the San Joaquin Valley. It's longer, stronger, and finer. And we have, uh, we've developed a relationship uh, over the last four years where we send this cotton uh, to a retailer in Italy. Uh, he has retail stores, 130 retail stores around the world of exclusive high-end products. Uh, they, they like the highest uh, quality of uh, cashmere, uh, bakuna, different, different uh, fibers that they process into different uh, articles of clothing. Well, great, Don. I appreciate you telling me the life cycle and how we grow this California cotton. I headed off to see how it's processed. Excellent, Ryan. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've headed over to the Cross Creek Gin in Corcoran, California, and with me I have gin manager Kirk Gilkey. Kirk, thanks for joining me. You're welcome, Ryan. Good to have you. Well, let's begin with a little bit about the history of this gin. Okay, this gin was built uh, by the Gilkey family in 1962. It was a saw gin, which is different from actually what it is today. Um, it's now today a partnership uh, with the Hansen and the Boyette family, and uh, we are basically a roller gin or a combination gin. We, we still have our saws in there, but we don't use them. And that's just the process of how you separate the fiber 
from the seed, and uh, we use rollers today to uh, do that with our Pima. And uh, besides the gin history, your family has a long history growing cotton in California. Yeah, we, we were growing cotton long before we had the gin. Uh, used to take our cotton to the J.G. Boswell gin uh, out in the lake bottom at the Melga gin, and, and uh, that gin actually is in uh, Australia now. They moved it out during <laughs> one of the floods. But in uh, uh, 1962, we decided that we had enough cotton, and uh, they made the decision to uh, build the gin on this spot, and it uh, remains here operating today. And now let's talk about the process and what we, we've been out in the field, we've seen it harvested, mm -hmm. and right behind us we have one of the completed modules. Absolutely, yeah. From the point that we see this module that's come from the field, what happens then? Well, you saw the moduling process, and we, we go out into the field and we pick these up with trucks, put them here in the module yard, and then uh, later on, depending on what the schedule is, we'll take them to the cotton gin, load them onto the module feeder, um, where they go into the gin, start the drying process, then we do what's called pre-cleaning, put them through a series of cleaning cleaners, and then we separate the cotton seed uh, from the lint, and that's done in a, at a roller gin stand. We have 18 roller gin stands. There's more cleaning that's done uh, after that, and then it's um, put into a 500-pound bale where we put uh, where we package it. We, uh, put a grade on it, U United States Department of Agriculture uh, grade, and then we'll put it on a truck where it'll be uh, taken away to warehouses and then eventually probably exported. And we, when we look at these modules, depending on the size, obviously there's different sizes between the modules, but we're looking at 10 to 13 tons approximately from the time when it enters the gin. And at the end, we're looking at that bale, approximately how much is the weight of that? Well, this, this, this probably weighs 24,000 pounds and there's probably 15 and a half bales in okay. it. 15, okay. 16, 16 bells on it, depending on what they call the turnout, and that's just how much trash is in it, how much moisture is in it, and then your cotton seed, and and what you're left with lint. And so the the, the net turnout normally in Pima cotton runs around 33 percent. 33 percent. So 33 so percent. So for every three pounds that comes in, you're hopefully going to get one pound of cotton Absol on the on absolutely, the back side. Yeah. yeah, three pounds of seed cotton, you get one one pound of lint. And Kirk, one of the things I saw is one of the employees actually taking two samples off of those bales. What are those used for? One will go to the buyer, and that's for his examination of the cotton. And the second will go to the United States Department of Agriculture classing office. And that will put a grade on the cotton, and that's, how, that's used for selling the cotton. So there's a lot of different characteristics that we look at uh, when, when selling the cotton, or the merchant looks at. And uh, it's length, strength, uniformity, uh, color, leaf content, and all these um, are used when the merchant will give us a price um, of the cotton. And uh, those are the, again, there's many characteristics that, that they have and they get more all the time. But uh, anyway, this cotton is uh, very high quality cotton and we don't have many problems with the grades right now. And uh, one of the fun things about cotton, we know it's one of the later things that we harvest here in the valley. It's typically the October, November period. How long will the gin run for? Well, it just depends on how many bales we're going to put through it. We're going to put through uh, 45,000 this year, 45,000 bales. So we'll probably run about 90 days. 90 days, okay. Yeah, we've run longer. We've run 100, 110 days. But so far, everything's going really well. So it'll probably be 90 days this year. Yeah. And uh, one of the fun facts that uh, when we were walking us through the facility is the fact that nothing goes to waste here. And we, we obviously you know cotton seed plays a very important part for the dairy industry and is used mm -hmm. as a additive feed. Mm -hmm. um, but you also were showing me something that I didn't know is the, the bedding that mm -hmm. you actually have that is uh, one of the byproducts of it. We actually uh, take it to dairies and they use it, they use it for you know, to soak up moisture and for bedding uh, in their uh, corrals. Wow, well this has been fantastic, Kirk. I thank you so much for showing me around and teaching me a little bit more about the cotton ginning industry. Uh, glad to have you. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you. Once again, it's time for us to bail out. I hope you've enjoyed learning about our fabulous fiber industry. Join me next time for more Valley's Gold.
Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E&J Gallo Winery.